Hello everyone, today is Thursday, October 8th, 2015, and this is the week in charts. First of all, first of all, I want to thank everybody for coming this week. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. I am humbled by the fact you guys and girls are here, so thank you so much. Looks like we've got a really good crowd this week. We might actually break a record, so I want to thank you on that. Uh, this week's webinar is brought to you by WebinarSoon.com. There's a webinar soon. In fact, there's one right now. <laughs> there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money to trading. If you've been trading for more than a few minutes, you probably already know that. Or as I like to say, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So what are we going to talk about? Well, I didn't want to go too far away from what we'll be talking about lately because it is so relevant. So I'm going to continue talking about the fact that we could be in an upcoming bear market. How I know um, and how I don't know for sure, but how I think we are. And also, what you could do about it. More importantly, what you could do about it. And also, we have a commodity comeback going on, and that could be the next bull market. So we need to take a look at that, and we will. Now, let's talk talk about moron or moron surviving and prospering during the upcoming bear market. So the first question is, okay, well, Dave, how do you know? there's going to be a bear market. And like I said last week and in recent videos, the, the answer is that I don't. But we are seeing some signs and there are some things to be concerned about. And as I've been preaching quite a bit, I've been um, probably to a point of a fault, I've been quoting my friend Greg Morris saying that uh, his a quote from him, which is one of my favorites, is uh, we treat all signals as if they will be the big one. And Greg has ran over the course of his life, billions and billions and billions of dollars. And he's one of the fund managers that does time the market. And when the market starts getting iffy, he's out. And when the market looks good again, he's back in. And I think that we have brains in our head, and I think we could use some common sense, and I think we have to – I think it's very important that you do time the market. And when the market is – generally going up you should generally be long and when it's going down you should be short and when it's going sideways you should be out and i tried to explain this to someone at a cocktail party last week and um my wife although she's heard it a thousand times she thought i was being flippant because the other person thought i was being flippant too <laughs> so uh but that's just the fact markets go up and markets go down and we're going to talk about this in just a few minutes but you tell that to someone, not you guys and girls, because you know what's going on. You know that markets go up and down, and you're traders, and you use stops, and you and you time the market with your own uh, methodology, or maybe even mine. But you tell people, the layman, you tell them, "Hey, markets go up, markets go down," and like they look at you, like you just, you know, it's like it's like going to Starbucks. You know, walk into Starbucks and ask for a cup of coffee. They look at you like you pooed your pants. You know, it's like same kind of you get the same kind of reaction. Then, you know, you're going to take a teenager with me when I go to Starbucks. So I, I tell them what I want, and then they translate, uh, you know, up, brood, room for vente, brood, up, brood, you know, room for creep. So it's the same sort of thing when you, you start talking about this market's up, market down thing. When you point out that the market may be going down or the market is going down, well, then all of a sudden they defend the market. Well, the market always goes up longer term. Well, yeah, but that longer term is often based, as again, quoting Greg again, an 81 year time horizon. And like I wrote in my column a couple of days ago, like Sweet Brown said, ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> Seriously, who has 81 years to invest? And, and if you think about it, okay, well, you're putting some money aside for Junior's College, okay, and. You're hoping that he goes to some, you know, prestigious university, and you're you're sacking away the money for Tulane or Rice or whatever other uh, university out there costs the fortune to go to. And the market goes into a bear market. Well, now you've got half the money that you had before. So where do you send Junior? Junior College? I mean, I don't know. So it's it's very important that you realize that markets go up and markets go down. And don't make any excuses for where they're going down. Sell first, 
and then ask questions later. Now, by sell first, we're going to get to this just one second. Like I said last week, that just means honoring your stops. If you have some longs that are still going higher, and like I said last week and week before, as uh, who was it? Jewel said in Pulp Fiction, he goes, that, that's got to be one charming pig. The fact that it could defy gravity. It, it, last week I showed you an IPO, and, and, um, and that IPO has since taken off. But that's the, that's the very minority, that very small minority. Most stocks have rolled over in here. So let's take a look at some of these things. And some of these signals again i don't know for sure there's going to be a bear market i hope there isn't okay and as somebody pointed out recently it, it, one of my peeps one of you guys in here um stop apologizing for the fact that you think the market might be headed lower just tell us what you see and stop apologizing so i guess i need to stop apologizing for that but people get pissed off at me when i say the market is headed lower and it kind of brings me back to the cocktail party thing and even with friends and family sometimes it's like if i start talking about being a bear, oh you always a bear it's like no no i've been a bull for the most part since 2009 okay things are changing a little bit now and i think we need to be careful so first and foremost i don't know for sure no one knows what a market will do for sure not you not me and certainly not the guy who screams on tv but there are some signs okay and I updated this chart from last week, and it's some interesting developments. But let me just kind of recap what we talked about. The market always goes up longer term, like I just said. And then last week I talked about permanent income hypothesis. So that's one of the only few big words I remember or phrases, I should say, from back in my MBA days. And I think permanent income hypothesis can apply to the market. So if you go way back to 2009, like I showed last week, and watch that show if you get bored this weekend or whatever. You can see that you'll see that the market has gone up a couple hundred percent and changed since then. So it's been a very happy experience for the buy and hold crowd. And one reason that technical analysis works is you get a new crop of people into the market every so many years. It also, human nature never changes. And we'll get to that in just one second. But like I said last week, it's pretty much been a straight line higher. There's been some bumps in the road along the way. But every time, like this last thing we had last October, it snapped right back. What did I do last October? Well, I allowed most of my longs to get stopped out. I think I survived several of them, believe it or not, through this because we were in longer-term trailing stop type positions. And then I started putting on some shorts. And I think most of those, except for maybe one or two, failed miserably. Uh, would I do the same thing again? Yes. Am I interviewing myself? Yes. <laughs> you have to treat all signals as if it's going to be the big one because you don't know if a trend will develop. Now, so we've had this bend in the trend. And then as I've been talking about ad nausea, and we've got this overhead supply, this is just simply a range where people have likely bought a market. And when a market drops below that overhead supply, these people begin to scratch your heads a little bit and to think about, well, should I scratch out? Should I get out at break even? And this is especially true for the Johnny Cub Latelys. And by Johnny Cub Latelys, I'm talking about those people who will watch this market go up, um, I guess in vain, since 2009. And they're like, this thing keeps going up, going up, going up, going up, going up, going up. It's like, oh, I'm not going to get caught on another 2008. I've, I've, I've lived through that. That was painful. So I've, I've stayed out of this silly market. Well, at some point in time, it's almost like their hand is forced. They throw in the towel and they get into the market. Well, when the market begins to tank, they're usually the last in and the first out. So that's like the fast buddy. Uh, there's no way I know it. Somebody says, how do I know everyone did sell? And I don't. But this sell off, that was way back here was really over two days, okay, three days if you count the first day down, but that was just sort of to the bottom of the range. But let's just say two or three days, okay? So that's not nearly enough time for people to get out. Now, maybe during some of this consolidations, people may have exited. I have no way of knowing. Keep in mind that technical analysis just gives you a general framework 
to work around. And like I said, you have signs, signals, setups, and then triggers. So the signs are there, the signals are there. We've even we even had setups and triggers. Doesn't mean that the market is going to do a certain thing. The market, as you know, could do whatever it wants. If we knew for sure, well, we'd all be sitting on our boats, and of course, you'd never see my fat ass again, as I often say. But we don't. But if we do for sure, we wouldn't bother with these pesky stops that occasionally stop us out and the market turns right back around, okay? But we don't, so we do. We do use stops on positions. So what's kind of interesting is, again, the human nature never changes. Uh, I bumped into um, a couple of people on the street, one literally, um, who was buying the dip. But Dave, you're a pullback player. Aren't you buying a dip? Well, not exactly, okay? We're buying a market that pulls back. We're buying a market that corrects if and only if it turns around and begins to go back up. A pullback should look like this. My pen will work. Come on, you could do it. Oh, here we go. A pullback should look like this. A pullback does not look like this, okay? This is actually a sell signal. This is an emerging trend. Notice that this market made a big picture inverted cup, and then it also made a handle subsequently to that, okay? And you could also argue, if you're into more classical technical analysis, that we have these multiple tops in here. And I'll flesh that out in just one second. And that we're just kind of this big topping formation. And by the way, the longer it takes for a pattern, I mean, I learned this from probably Edwards and McGee or, or Schaubacher or somebody going way back 50, 60, 70 years ago in their books, uh, from books that old, I should say, that the longer a pattern takes to form, the more important that pattern is. So if you see something base for three or four or five years, and all of a sudden it begins to take off out of that base, there might be a few fits and starts, but once that trend gets established, it's possible that it could go for a long, long time. In general, traders don't agree for long. So if you get a trading range, and it's just human nature. I'm, I'm sorry. You're just reading the psychology of the market. You're reading the human nature of the market. You know that that zone, so to speak, or that trading range is perceived as a value zone. People begin to agree upon prices. That's about where prices should be. Markets move from a state of disequilibrium to equally equilibrium, but usually they don't stay in that equilibrium for long. There's always this price discovery type of mechanism that's happening, supply and demand. That's all it is, okay? Buying pressure, selling pressure. That's all it is when you boil it all down. So, you know, what could be more fundamental than that? People who are who can't believe I don't use any fundamentals, well, what could be more fundamental than supply and demand? And by the way, I don't want to digress too far, but once again, something else I got from Greg. What's the most common used fundamental indicator? P.E.? Well, I use half of it. I use half the P.E. What's the top of the P.E.? Price. Okay? I just don't use the E. So it's kind of ironic that the most popular fundamental metric, the P.E., price to earnings ratio of a stock, has price as half of its component. Now, before I digress too far, again, down here, some bottom fishers came in and tried to catch the proverbial knife, as I often talk about and as I've written about extensively recently. Okay? And then they felt pretty smart because the market sort of went straight up from there. Now, the problem is, as, as one of these aforementioned people I talk to, and I, I try not to get into markets when I'm talking with just the, the layman, because it's just a, it's, it's just, it's going to end badly. Well, it's going to end badly when the market's rolling over like this. But in general, I try to avoid those type of conversations. I just do my business where I am or enjoy my cocktail if I'm at a cocktail party or whatever and try to completely avoid these conversations. But they felt really smart. And one person in particular, I'm like, well, what's your plan? You know, and, and again, she looked at me like I ordered a cup of coffee at Starbucks, you know. <sighs> plan, what's that? I'll, I'll, I'll behold it. 
it's going to go up longer term. You know, so that's not a plan. And then, of course, market right, ro rolls right back over. And these people are thinking, oh, boo, you know, wait a minute. I got to rethink things. But what's amazing is the market bounces. Well, it's not amazing that the market bounced, but what's amazing is on that market bounce, I start getting emails. Dave, is this the bottom? And I don't think so. I think there are bigger picture things that work, such as, again, this, this bend in this trend, this overhead supply, and then it, we're going to take a look at the bow ties here just one second. Of course, we had the death cross. I'm not going to beat that dead horse anymore. You can go back and watch the recent videos on that. And one more thing to think about is that, again, on a net-net change, as we talked about last week, go back to last September. You can even go back to, it depends on what time of day it is, even way back to last July, or I should say, I guess last July would be 2015, July of 2014. And you can see the market is actually lower, depending on what time of day it is, I suppose, than it was back then. So the longer your portfolio for a buy and hold type or for an investor type, but the longer your portfolio is underwater, the more pressure is put upon you to think, or I should say rethink, your decision to be in the markets. And that's more, mostly important for the persons who entered this market uh, any time since last summer and now. So the more pressure is being put on those people. But there's also, again, this is um, my MBA going to rear its ugly head, which it doesn't really do that often. Um, I think I had a – I think I put up my green screen for my uh, – do I have it on a wall anymore? No. I put up my green screen for my uh, <laughs> for my studio, and I covered up my MBA. It's like an MBA is not going to do you much good in this business, um, but it makes you look smart, I suppose. I don't know. Anyway, but that's one of the few things I've ever mentioned from my MBA is the permanent income hypothesis, and you don't have to get an MBA to learn about that. But I think that those who bought somewhere between – 2014 to 2009, they're beginning to see a, a loss of capital. And as sometimes I, I point out, and, and I'm not the first person who's pointed this out, I don't, I don't know where I picked it up. If I did, I'd be happy to give them credit, but I, I don't know where I picked it up. I've just picked it up through osmosis, I suppose. But sometimes return of capital capital, we tried to say, is more important than return on capital. So as this market deteriorates and on a net net basis, we are lower than we were months ago and even a year ago or more, then that permanent income hypothesis, they have to kind of rethink that permanent income hypothesis, money making machine, might be coming to an end. So, again, they start thinking more about return of capital. Capital? I don't, want, I don't know why I'm putting a B in there. Capital. Return of capital versus return on capital. And then, um, I, again, you know, not to name drop, but I know all these guys, and, and they're good guys. But uh, like Tom McClellan once told me that his mother said, and I've heard a lot of other guys quote him on this, and his mother, Marion, um, who's no longer with us, but she once said that people buy stocks for a variety of reasons. And I might be paraphrasing a little bit, but people, some people buy stocks when they have money. Some people sell stocks, buy and sell stocks for a variety of reasons. Some people sell stocks when they need the money. And others use far more sophisticated methods. So let's think about the selling. You know, we have to never forget there are people behind the bars, okay? It's not just squiggles on the chart. And as, as Tom McClellan also said, and that's what led us to that prior quote, he says, and those people will screw you, okay? So people buy and sell for a variety of reasons. So what if 
someone is getting ready to send that kid off to school, and then you start taking some money out of the market. Well, as long as that market's going up, they're going to leave that money be and try to access as little bit of it as possible. But if that market begins rolling over, they're going to be a little bit more nervous and maybe take more out of it. So never forget that it's human nature. And the other thing, too, just getting back to this one more time, and, and that's like like I said, last Friday I started getting emails. Is this the bottom? Well, this is a little small pattern here. I wouldn't get too excited about this little pattern here. Would you have this whole pattern right here, which looks like a major top for those aforementioned reasons? The other question I, I get is like, okay, Dave, is this a double bottom? Well, it might be on a micro sense. But a double bottom for me, and we're going to look at one in just one second here, is something that looks like this, okay? Something that after a long, 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 long downtrend, the market bottoms out, and you get that double bottom. It's not when a market does this at high levels, okay? Now, the market might go up from here. Again, it could do whatever it wants. But I'm not going to get too excited about a short-term little bottom in the overall market where the market still has a lot of work cut out for it, okay? Now, let's get to the signal real quick. Obviously, we have, as I've been talking about quite a bit, we have the bow tie on a weekly basis. And we triggered, and we also triggered on a multi-week basis, okay? This is your little pullback here, and this would be your trigger. And then, like I said, if we trigger on a multi-week basis, this market could be in a lot of trouble. But Dave, it's just going up since then. Well, it, again, it could do whatever it wants. But I think it pays to pay attention. And I think you could err on the side of being a little overly cautious at this juncture. Now, the reason this bow tie on a weekly basis is significant, remember, when emerging trend signals, we're only looking at those signals that occur on the fringe off of multi, multi year lows or all time highs, like that and like that. Those last two were all time highs, 2000 and obviously 2000 and seven slash 2008. Okay, when we had this bow tie here, and then 2000, obviously, this bow tie here. And what's fascinating is this is a weekly chart, and look at this bow tie. Look at where this bow tie formed. Look at where this bow tie formed, okay? The market still dropped nearly 50% afterwards. So even though you're going to have some lag in these indicators, the market could still do, could still have a lot of trend afterwards. So I think it pays to pay attention. And I keep coming back to everything works better with trend. And as I talked about it quite a bit, I've got the 50-day moving average in here. I guess in this case it would be the 50-week moving average, and that's this right here. I don't know if you can see it well on your screens. But you can see that we have daylight, meaning that the lows are greater than the moving average, okay? Now, what's pretty freaking awesome is, again, as I say, everything works better with trend. I can't beat that dead horse enough. John says, don't forget that even a dead cat will bounce. Well, John, you know, whenever I talk about the dead cat bounce, I get a plethora of emails. It's like, it's just a figure of speech, okay? <laughs> Don't get too caught up in that. And besides, the cat was dead anyway, all right? It didn't hurt it just because he got dropped. And let's just assume he was accidentally dropped. It, it, let's, let's assume he had a good life. Let's assume he, like, he did his business in a litter box, and then he walked around and got on top of the top of the. Uh, he walked around the kitchen counter, you know, where all the food is served all day long while his owner was away, and you know, he as uh, talking heads. I think David Byrne once said, he you know he enjoyed the he enjoyed his house more than his human. Cats enjoy houses more than people. So he had a great life. He just happened to get accidentally dropped. You now it's a figure of speech. I know I'm being silly, but I, relax, everyone. Please don't take yourselves too seriously. I, I certainly don't. Uh, but you can see we had the daylight. And again, not to beat the dead horse. Why is it okay to beat a dead horse but not drop a dead cat? I don't know. But anyway, beat the dead horse seems a lot worse than dropping a dead cat. 
But you can see throughout this entire trend here, and I'll try to draw it in best I can. We had one little day or one little week, I should say, of daylight down there. It didn't even have daylight. It just kind of dipped below. You had a little daylight back in, in 98, I guess. That's Anybody remember what happened in 98? Was that the Asian crisis or was, or was this the Asian crisis back here? I forget. But something happened in 98. And the market just continued higher. So, again, everything works better than trend. And I'm all proud of my bow ties, and, and I shouldn't say this too much because it kind of discounts my, my what I think is something a wonderful discovery. But just take a look at this 50-week, 50, 50 I'm sorry, moving average, and just watch the slope of this average, okay? Slope is mostly down throughout this entire period. Slope is mostly up throughout this entire period, down, and then up again. So something as simple as daylight or even a moving average slope, can help to keep you on the right side of the market. Now, keep in mind that an emerging trend, you are getting a little er in a little early. It is a little dangerous, okay? A safer place, haha, safe in this business, right? But a safer place would be to get into this market or short side at least. If you let the market fall a little bit more, and then when that trend does appear to be uh, not, not just emerging, but a little bit more... Um, that's a good word for saying established, a little bit more established and not just emerging. Then then maybe start shorting. OK, and that's the thing, too. I've been a little slow to get short during this cycle. And my feeling is and the way I've been reason I've been so cautious that kind of slow to get short is because I feel like if this is the real deal. Like a 2000 or like a 2008. We're going to have plenty enough time to get short along the way. Yes, they do slide faster than they glide, which is an old Wall Street adage, one of the few ones that is true. But I don't think that it's going to be over in a few days, and that's going to be it. But again, everything works better with trend. In the long run, we may be dead. Well, in the long term, we will be dead, right? Hey, Reverend Dave. I guess that's from earlier. Hey, Howard. Good to see you here. All right, so what do we do? Well, I'm not going to beat the dead horse. Oh, there we go again. Beat the dead horse. Too much on this because I talked about it a lot last week. But there are a few things I want to flesh out a little bit. Um, first of all, on any stops on any leftover longs, like I said, doesn't mean you should rush out and sell just because the market starts looking a little iffy. But do honor your stops and do have a plan. As long as you have a plan in place... I don't care what your methodology is. I might not agree with your methodology, but as long as you have a plan in place, which includes some money and position management, that I do care about, which is sound money and position management, then do whatever you want, as long as it is a viable methodology, as long as you're successful. But part of that plan has to be to have stops, okay? You could all be wrong. I could be wrong. I wish I was wrong a hell of a lot less, okay? Uh, what's the, you know, it's like, it's like whatever I'm wrong, sometimes I'll tell my wife, so, well, it was a guy that was never wrong and they nailed him to a tree, you know, so um, I'm human, I'm going to be wrong. Again, don't try to catch falling knives, stocks are not on sale, wait for them to start going back up before even thinking about buying them. Uh, continue to seek out inefficiencies, I've got an article under free reports on my website, if you don't see a free report banner on the website, just simply go to store. And it's the first thing in a store. Yeah, I make you walk through the gift shop like they do at the Vatican and Disney World and all these other places. But uh, get the free reports, and hopefully you like what you see. Uh, cash is not trash. Yes, we're all traders, okay? But so what, okay? There's nothing wrong with sitting cash. Shorts are a pain in the ass. I'm not going to get out here and preach, oh, shorts are great. It's the greatest thing ever. Although I was feeling like that coming into today, we had a short that was just going down ever since we, we got in it, you know, except for the first day. But so far, so good. And then today it's bouncing a little bit. So it's making me rethink the short side thing again. But we've talked about this quite a bit over the last few weeks. Shorts are kind of a pain in the butt. But I think they're a necessary evil, not just because it's the only way to make money when the market goes down, but more importantly – more importantly, it helps you to see both sides of the market. As I've said quite a bit, those who tend to be long-only oriented, 
it's the glass is always half full. They're always kind of talking their position like, oh, it'll come back. And I don't want to pick on these people too much because some of these people, it's their charters. They have to be long stock, as I said quite a bit. I know people in an industry where if they're not long stock and the market goes straight up and has a major reversal or whatever, and they're not long stock, they'll lose their job. Because clients will get pissed off because, well, why weren't you in stocks? But if the stock market rolls over and they're long stock and they lose money, then there's a good chance they'll keep their job because they're supposed to be in stocks. And that's kind of a perverse thing that happens. But let's not get too far into that. Now, consider commodity stocks. So this is what I really want to flesh out this week. And we'll get to that in just one second. Consider co commodity-related stocks that can, as can is a key word in this sentence, trade contra to the overall market, but only if they are going up and they're starting to go up. I've been talking about these things for for weeks, okay? And now it looks like they're finally beginning to move. Like I've been saying, sometimes it's a process more than an event. Dave, why'd you go in if you thought it was a bottom? Like, why'd you try to catch that bottom? Because as I often also say, sometimes it's 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 darkest right before it gets more dark. That might be a yogiism. I'm bummed out. I, I just found out today that yogi's no longer with us. That's a bummer. He died in September. Kind of reminds me of a Karen story. My friend, uh, a friend of mine's wife, Karen. She always tells the, the story, right? The horrible story right before the entree is served. Uh, dinner served. <laughs> and then a snake bit the kid. And the father went under the house to check on the kid. Then the snake bit the father. And then the mother went underneath. And the snake bit the mother. And then they all died. Okay, here's here's the roast beef. <laughs> anyway, I digress. But I talked about that in a recent column. Uh, anyway, uh, short stocks are not again. Shorts are paid in the butt. Uh, as I said, quite a bit in these webinars. Are they worth it? Probably not. I mean, I don't know. You make a little money on the short side. I guess it's better to poke in the eye. As I think I said, on a mechanical basis, strictly mechanical basis, without any discretion, I think, and I should have gone and looked at it before this seminar, webinar, but I think we were up low double digits, our high single digits in 2000. And nine, which was a uh, 2008, I should say, which was a pretty amazing feat if you think about it. I think at the end we gave up some of those profits to uh, in, only end up like eight or nine or, or, or 10, 11 percent for the year. But that's pretty impressive when the market is down 50 percent in tra year and then the mark ends a year down 40 percent for the year. So there's nothing wrong with shorts and they're not evil. I think they're a necessary evil though. One, because obviously it's the only way to make money when the market's going down. But two, and more importantly, it does help you to see both sides of the market. If you're long a bunch of stocks and you start seeing sell signals to the downside, such as the aforementioned bow ties, then it really makes you start thinking about and questioning your positions. And you don't have to rush out and sell them all because it might just be a correction and it might not be the end of the world. But you do, again, here, go beating that dead horse again. You do need to honor your stop. So let's let's go back to the commodities. Let's revisit that. So are these going to be the next bull markets? Well, this is a slide I put in last week, and it's kind of cool because this is this is the energies, and I've been talking about it being a, more of a process than an event, and it's always darkest again, you know, before it gets more dark. Okay, so they looked like a they were pretty sold out here, but then what they do? They went down and made new lows. Now, let me show you something about the new lows that they made, which I think is really cool. Notice that it made a low here, and then it made another low here. Now, classical technical analysis says a double bottom looks like this, a W. Well, what I have observed is rarely do they unfold like that. You either get a higher low for the second part of the bottom, or you get a lower low, okay? And both of these are fake outs, by the way. Because in this case, it looks like it's going back to all lows, and it doesn't. In this case, it's going looks like it's it's going to just keep imploding. 
I like this pattern better than others. And it's probably some sort of, um, I don't want to say anyone's names. That's probably some sort of esoteric pattern where it, um, and there's probably some bases behind, not bases behind it, but somebody's probably named this lower double bottom. But I just call it a double bottom where you get that, that lower low, and then the market begins to take off. So, so far, I think this is about a 15% rally or more. I forget exactly where it was. Somebody can measure it if they want. So, so far, so good as far as the energy stocks. Now, we are long USO. We got long back here. I think we just finally got into the black, and then we kind of were dipping below that level. But it hasn't done anything wrong just yet. So far, it's just consolidating. So maybe it's getting ready to make a new leg higher. I don't know. But we're long USO already because it looks like the energy stocks – I'm sorry. It looks like the energy's turned before the energy stocks. And as Walter Deemer or someone – I think it was Walter Deemer said recently, sometimes you end up with four selling, especially in something like the energies. And I think that's what we're seeing now. I don't want to confuse fundamentals with the situation, but – as I've been saying for the last couple of weeks, I live in South Louisiana, and uh, a lot of people, unfortunately, are losing their jobs because these oil companies are laying off like crazy. There was just one, uh, I don't know who it was, Chevron or one of them, just laid off a whole bunch of people down in Fouchon. And a lot of people, it's getting kind of iffy. And a friend of mine stopped by a couple of days ago, and, you know, he's okay, and he's pretty solid at what he's doing. But all the people around him seem to be dropping like flies. Well, that tells me that the, the, these oil companies are, are forced layoff. And then there's also sometimes in these commodity-related stocks, as Walter Deaver was explaining, there's like a, a forced selling. So that kind of looked like forced selling. That last little that last little kind of drift lower in here where it found its low and then took off again. Years ago, somebody sent me a paper on a market, and it's kind of bizarre. I hate to even talk about it, but it, they talked about how the market has – it's like digesting a meal. They talked about how this last little uh, pattern occurs. I think they called it a tongue. And to me, that looks like a tongue because it just it just kind of like the market just kind of goes, bah. I, I, I don't know if that's the reasoning or why they call it a tongue. But that's what I that's what I call that pattern. Now, it's not a tradable pattern, okay? But it is, like I said, a sign. Sign signals, okay? The signal would be this, the thrust higher. And then you're going to have the setup and the trigger on the next two things to look for. But again, you know, it had kind of this dead cat bounce, if you guys want to call it that. And then it just kind of went, bleh, came down here and made its final low. Okay, I don't know this is final low. Like I've said quite a bit, especially commodity-related stocks, it could, it could, the bottoms, as I've been saying quite a bit, could be more of a process than an event. It could certainly go back down and retest those lows. What would that give us if it did? Anyone here knows what that would look like? Let me draw it in for you. What would that look like if we did – went down and retested those lows or got close to those lows, okay? It would look like a head and shoulders bottom. So it could still make a head and shoulders bottom. And that's why you can't just pick one technical pattern and say, oh, that's it, okay? Because another technical pattern could still develop. Now, but wait a minute, Dave. You say technical analysis doesn't work because you have more than one pattern or one pattern could later develop. No, I'm saying it works, but you want to have some sort of setup that follows those signs and signals that you're seeing. So I think the setup here is going to be a first thrust, although the moving average is going to catch up to it really quick. We could have a bow tie at the overall energy. So along those same lines, by the way, this is the crude here, basis of USO. This is a first thrust. You get a sharp rally from lows. Your first little pullback is here. It looked like it was off to the races here. So far, we've been mediocrely right, okay, because now it's higher than it was when we got in, at least it was yesterday. Now, let's take a look at the metals and mining. Now, this one's a little bit more gradual in the bottoming process. And in fact, you know, now I'm looking at this, I kind of like it even more than the energies because it just kind of came down base that it kind of tested its lows and then based. And this just looks like a market that's running out of steam. So let me just kind of draw it in for you. And this will kind of be a fun thing to do. Okay. You can see the market's dropping. And dropping, and then it's kind of, then it kind of goes sideways, it drops, and then sideways, and then drops. So that you can see that this is definitely a slowing of momentum. I'm not a big fan of oscillators or anything, but I bet if you put some sort of longer-term oscillator on this thing, it probably would look like this, and then it probably would have some sort of divergence that look like that. 
Okay, I just prefer to eyeball the charts, but even just eyeballing it, or even if you want to put the moving averages in, you can see the moving averages are doing this as opposed to doing what? Doing that. Okay, write that down. All right. Notice your slope of your moving average over time. It's pretty serious here, but over here has really begun to flatten out. Okay. And you can kind of vary your time frames to get it even flatter. The longer term moving averages obviously are going to be even flatter. And if you're using your simple moving averages, then obviously you can see that they're beginning to kind of lose steam and kind of the slope is beginning to decrease. You know, I would say study the slope of the moving average and, and really pay attention to it. The only problem with doing that is you, you might get stuck doing a lot of things I did early in my career, like, okay, well, let's quantify that. And then let's do a uh, rate of change of moving averages. And before you know it, you're adding indicators to indicators. And then you're in that second, third, and fourth derivative, okay? So I like just a pure moving average and just kind of eyeball what it's doing. And don't, don't spend too much time quantifying it. But I can see the moving averages in this chart have slowed their descent and have actually been begun to ascent higher. Ascent, is that the right word? Uh, begin to go higher. Now, here's the thing. Can the commodities save the bull? My quick answer to that is no. I don't think we could have a market based on commodities. And by the way, while I was getting a cup of, um, a glass of water before this uh, uh, presentation, uh, I was thinking that one thing I wanted to say is that you got to be careful in markets not to fight the last war. So... Biotech was our leader and drugs was our leader and maybe to a little bit lesser extent health services in the last bull market. I think that those will probably not be our leaders in the next bull market. Okay. As a general statement, there's going to be new leaders that emerge. And right now those new leaders that are possibly emerging or the commodity related stocks. Now the question is, can we have a bull market just as commodity related stocks? Uh, no, I don't think so. But I will tell you this, I think a lot of the recent rally that we've seen is based on the fact that these commodities have gotten off their butts and going straight up. Take a look at those aforementioned energies and they're up like 15% from the lows. I think metals 12 or 13% from the lows, metals and mining. So that could push a market significantly higher. So if you're looking at the Dow, you've got Chevron in here. That's obviously an energy company. And then you got Exxon. That's obviously an energy company. And both of those stocks so far, I think, are going straight up. They're not something that I would trade because they're big and thick and tough to trade. I'd maybe short them sometimes. But you also have DuPont. Okay. Now, DuPont's a chemical company, but... The chemical company is going up right now, and you can kind of argue that, well, the chemical company is sort of a commodity-related type of product. And I don't know how to flesh that article out too much. I know DuPont's kind of a conglomerate chemical company, but I'm sure some of the chemicals are used for energies and maybe even mining. I don't know. But all I know is that chemicals are headed higher, and maybe you could consider a commodity uh, a, 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 I'm sorry, maybe you could consider a chemical company a commodity-related company. I don't know. Uh, let me throw it out to you guys and girls. Let me know what you think. Uh, do you think a chemical company is um, a commodity type of company? And they're, they're going higher. So I've kind of had, got a question mark on that one. But it did kind of catch my eye when I was going through the Dow. And obviously, if you go through the S&P, you're going to have quite a few metals of mining. I think we used to have, uh, was it Alcoa in here? Uh, the Dow, but it looks like we don't even have a metal anymore in the Dow. I rarely look at the Dow. I don't really care about the Dow. But the reason, well, Dave, why we're looking at it now, well, I want to show you that indices are made up of stocks. I know, duh. But sometimes those stocks could be in areas like metals and mining, and sometimes those areas can rally. I don't think metals and mining and the energies and chemicals, if they count, are going to be enough to give us a bull market. But they might stop the slide a little bit if the market is trying to go lower and you never know what a catalyst will come from. Sometimes buying begets more buying. If these companies can push the indices higher, then maybe people breathe a sigh of relief. And then that changes 
the the feelings of the people in the market. I, I almost said sentiment. Uh, someone pointed out today they, they want to know if I use sentiment, and they said they did. My problem with sentiment is sentiment is always going to be its highest when the market is making new highs. So I'm sure if you looked at sentiment since 2009, it's been incredible. And then, up, oh, sure enough, the market turned when sentiment was at its highest. Well, it's been its highest for years, okay? So anything that you can't really time a market with, toss it out. It's just going to create analysis paralysis. Now, it's not my way or highway. If you use sentiment and you think you could use it, then, then God bless you. You know, go out and use it. Do what you want. Again, it's not my way or highway. I'm glad you guys and girls are doing a variety of other things. I think it's I think it's cool. I, I'm, I'm more impressed that you do that than if you just followed me on a, on a what's the word, rogue basis? My brain is not working today for some reason. But anyway, so we have some commodities. Uh, can they save the bull market? I don't think so. Again, some random thoughts here. Human nature never changes, so the market begins. To, as soon as the market begins to bounce just a little bit, all of a sudden, the bulls come out the, the woodwork. I think that's kind of interesting. I think I will still be careful with one of these retrace rallies. This was left in from last week. Um, market is still kind of iffy. I don't think that these rallies we've been seeing are sustainable, at least not yet. And the other thing that I thought about right before the show is people have been asking me, uh, what would it take for me to get bullish again? And the quick answer or the short answer on that is the market would have to make new highs. So – this market would have to come up here, the S&P 500 or NASDAQ, whatever you want to look at, and make brand new highs. But, well, Dave, what about between here and here? So what? So what? So I sit on my hands. I let a little rally go by. It ain't going to kill me. No big deal. So what? But everyone seems to want to catch every zig at every zag, okay? You're going to wear yourself out doing that. Keep your eye on the ball. Keep focused on the big picture. Keep focused on the longer term. Even though we're kind of short-term swing traders who like to hold positions longer term, okay, you still want to focus on the longer term. And day traders who look at monthly and quarterly charts just to get a real good feel for the market is, and as a general statement, they focus on that side of the market. The day traders that are, that are other successful – they're trading mostly longs in bull markets and mostly shorts in bear markets, even though they're just day trading. They're putting that market behind them, okay? So put the market behind you. There's no need to get excited and try to be a hero and buy stocks other than possibly energies and metals and mining between now and maybe chemicals between now and the new high, okay? So that's what it would take to have me start getting bullish in here. As a trend follower, we have to wait for a trend to follow. Now, the great news is sometimes you get these emerging trends, like in the aforementioned energies and metals and mining. I think I beat the dead horse enough on those. There I go, beating that dead horse again. <laughs> I had a military guy once said that his sergeant, his drill sergeant said, you can't beat a dead horse, but you can flatten it. So I'm pretty bad about flattening a dead horse. My kids drives them nuts. Wife, too, when I beat the dead horse. Short trip, I guess. Uh, pick your spots carefully. That, again, just make sure you really, really like a stock, especially on the long side. It's got to be phenomenal. Uh, I've had a few setups lately on the long side that look pretty damn good, and I passed on them. And they've gone higher. Not all of them, but some of them. But I'm okay with that. And you got to be careful because let's say you look at 10 stocks on the long side, and, and you like them kind of in a mediocre way. Well, let's say that one out of those 10 stocks take off and then the other nine roll over. Well, we have a bad problem as human beings of either selective perception just by looking at that one stock and then cursing yourself and missing it or a perceptual distortion. You're, you're missing the fact that most of the stocks went down except for that one stock that you're looking at, okay? But if you'd have taken all those positions, you'd have lost a lot of money. So it's better to miss that one position than lose a whole lot of money. And as I've been saying quite a bit, and I think I've got it in here somewhere, uh, the better to, better to be in a dock thing. You know, it's, yeah, here we go, right here. Sometimes it means a waiting, okay? Better to be in a dock wishing you were out at sea than being out at sea wishing you were on a dock. And like I said last week, I was on a boat that was literally sinking, 
in the middle of the freaking Atlantic Ocean. And you don't, you're not too worried about little nitpicky things when that happens. It's like, it was, it's like, bam, it's like your head just clears <laughs> and you're not worried about stops getting hit. You're not worried about if your grass needs cutting, you're not worried about anything. You're just thinking like, uh, this is it. And then it's the most clearest my head has ever been in my entire life. Uh, but luckily we, uh, we found the problem and we, we fixed it. And uh, thank God to uh, to build pumps and and let me tell you the best for those of you who are sailors or boaters. Um, and this is I, I don't hate to do any endorsements, okay? But uh, this is the best bilge pump in the world. A scared man with a bucket is the most impressive bilge pump in the world. Nothing could beat that out. So that's that's the so you want to make sure you have a bucket on your boat, and that's your bilge pump. Uh, again, like I've been saying, this is a real deal. Well, plenty enough time to get short. You know, market's here, okay? If it's a real deal, it's going to here. So somewhere between here and here, we'll get short. Don't worry about that. Uh, now, this is something that I, I have to keep reiterating this point. I'm not sure why. But you want to pick stocks that are relatively higher levels versus short those that are already sold out longer term. Now, this has been left in for a few weeks, okay? So you want to be shorting maybe biotech now, though that's a little dangerous. I know to short the biotechs, but it's a great example. I mean, maybe health services to um, uh, same uh, same extent. Health services. We're short a health service stock right now, MOH. Okay. Uh, so biotech, health services. That's probably where you want to look for opportunities on the short side, versus the energies, which look like this. And in fact, as we just showed, maybe they're making a turn. Okay. All right. Um, I have a new report. I've already forgotten what it's about. Uh, I have to look at my website. Uh, it's the last article I did for Traders Magazine. I think, oh, it's money management. We talked about this last couple of weeks. Uh, they put it on the basics, but I thought it was a little bit more than just a basic article. But uh, if you don't have your head wrapped around the money management, I think this article will, will do a good job of getting you there. Read it, download it, check it out. Download it, I guess, first, then read it. And then email me if you have any questions on that. I'd be happy to help you. Uh, new this week, still on the website, so check that out. And then uh, Vegas next week, so there's going to be no chart show next week. So um, you guys enjoy your break. Uh, again, this is um, this is from another webinar, but again, I answer my own yeah, I answer all my own emails. I have a YouTube channel. Please uh, check that out. And then um, obviously check out my website. All right, we've got a lot of questions coming in. So let me go ahead and start looking at the markets. And then as your questions relate to the markets, I will, um, I'll answer them. And then we'll get to the rest of them uh, as we get further down the pike. Okay. Let's take a look at the... And we already spent a little time already on all this stuff, so there's no need to spend beat the dead horse on all this stuff. There I go again, beating a dead horse. I've seen those. What do you call those? Emoticons or whatever people have on the websites. It's, it's like I read a lot of forums. Uh, uh, not so many, not too many regarding trading because it just kind of pisses me off. But like other hobbies and other things, I'm doing DIY projects around the house. I read the forums. And a lot of these guys have like a little cartoon character beating a dead horse. It's kind of a uh, I, that could be me at times. I know. All right. What are the P's doing? Well, on a micro level, they're just kind of sitting there, obviously. Um, we do have this kind of a consolidation below a consolidation. Now, if we get back to box theory, as I've talked about quite a bit in these things, a la Darvis box style, you know, sometimes you could just think about a market in a very, very simple fashion. Just think about the market in boxes, okay, as boxes. Is it making a lower box or is it making a higher box? Well, right now it's making a lower box. And, and is that going to be the new equilibrium for the market? I don't know. But what I can tell you is if a market has been trading sideways, and let's uh, see what the dates are on this. Oops. So since August, okay, so August, end of August, so six weeks, is that six weeks? Let's see, September, we four weeks, uh, okay, six, seven, eight weeks in here. So 
I can guarantee you there's been some trading in here. It's one of the few things I can guarantee. So is this the new equilibrium from the market? I don't know, but it could be. So if we drop below this, I would be very concerned. If we stay around this, eh, I'll just kind of maybe I'll become ambivalent eventually. But right now, what's the other word? What do you call it when you're um, agnostic? Maybe I've become a little bit more agnostic. It's like the uh, dyslexic, insomniac, agnostic. Stayed up all night, wonder if there really was a dog. But you can see we've got a lot of overhead supply in here still. Again, not to, well, there, here comes again, beat the dead horse. Uh, so I think the market's going to have a hard time getting through this. Stranger things have happened. Uh, you know what I hope? I hope it blows through it, and I hope all this uh, concerns in here were just um, a waste of my time and energy. But you have to, what is is when it comes to markets? Uh, NASDAQ down a little bit today. Well, more than a little bit, three-quarters of a percent. What are the P's down right now? P's are down just a smidge. Well, maybe the P's are getting buoyed a little bit by those commodity-related stocks, those aforementioned commodity-related stocks. And the NASDAQ being a little bit more broader and a little bit more tech-related is probably feeling that pressure. Okay. Now, as far as the sectors, again, we've already talked quite a bit about the energies and all. Obviously, I'm a bull there. So let's see if we could find them real quick. There's the energies. So far, so good. Nice rally from lows and diddle for metals and mining. So keep an eye on these areas for potential setups soon. Most of the areas, especially some of these previous high flyers like the drugs and biotech, they still look like they're in a lot of trouble. They had a sharp sell-off. They pull back, sharp sell-off. And so far, this is just a pullback in here. Health services, another one of those areas, I think is still in a lot of trouble. Okay? Thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback. Rinse and repeat? I don't know. But it sure looks like that. Okay? And different. That's an, there's another word for that. Agnostic is, was, was a word I think I was looking for. Um, like I mentioned, we're short MOH. And it's getting a little bit of a bounce today. Oh, it was earlier. There you go. See, so this is why you don't get too caught up in looking at the intraday action. It's already turned around, okay? So, like I said, quite a bit. Sometimes I'll look at charts, drop an F-bomb, walk around a block, and come around, come back to the charts, and they've already turned around. But you can see we've got a thrust down here from multiple tops. And if you back the chart out a little bit, this stock looks like it's in a lot of trouble. It did really well for a long, long time, and now it's beginning to roll over. Not the cleanest chart in the world, but sometimes on the short side, you're kind of left with a little bit of um, not so good stocks. What kind of strategy would you use to get long gold or energy stocks? I would use bow ties and first thrust right now or any other emerging trend patterns. Okay. Um, so, like, take a look at gold. Let's take a look at, like, the bow tie here. Um, that's an invisible chart. How do I get the real bow tie? Here we go. No? Oh, I saved my charts. I was working on, uh, let me fix this. I was working on uh, um, this chart show, and I made all my charts white. Uh, let's go back to like a yellow or something. Okay, here we go. Uh, notice that gold, okay, you mentioned gold. You've got a bow tie in here. So in the first little dip, uh, be worth buying. So keep an eye out for the same pattern in the stocks. Match the pattern to the market is what I often preach, and that's why I'm saying if you're going to short stocks now, short the stocks that are rolling over from high levels like the overall market, like biotech, like drugs, like health services, okay? And don't run out in short areas like energies, which are at longer-term downtrends but could be turning the corner, okay? So look for emerging trend patterns, uh, bow ties, first thrust, and whatever other emerging trend patterns I have out there that could escape me at the moment. Uh, not so much gatekeepers because gatekeepers, I kind of like that pattern a little bit better at the top, than at bottoms, although it does occur sometimes uh, during the bottoms of the market, but I like it better at tops. Uh, reversal gap strategy might be something to pay attention to. But bow ties at first thrust are my two favorites, and usually everything kind of boils down to one or two, one of those two things. Um, a lot of areas, and this is this is why it's dangerous to play the relative strength game, okay? And I do manage a list. This is not an actually traded list. This is just for fun. And I've learned a lot in the process. It's a real pain in the butt to do, and it takes a lot of work. But I feel like the work is worthwhile, even though I'm not seeing a direct 
monetary impact that I could I could draw to it and say, oh yeah, I made money because of these stocks or whatever. But it does help me to manage a momentum list. And in doing so, it forces me to look at some areas that I might not look at, I might not be too excited about. And recently, back here, while the market was tanking, and somewhere around the market was tanking, I was putting some home builders and material construction stocks into that list. And then what's happened subsequently? Obviously, they've tanked, okay? So that's where you got to be really careful chasing that momentum when the overall conditions are beginning to change. And that's something you need to kind of write down. And I'm a big fan of relative strength. And I'm a big fan of some of these people that do a lot of work. Uh, Mike Moody uh, comes to mind. Um, Mike was with Dorsey and Wright for a long time. I think he's off on his own now. Uh, he does a lot of relative strength work. Um, Gary, is it Gary Anderson? I have yet to get and read his book. I apologize for that. I've been threatening to do that for, for a while, but I've just, there's so much going on. It's just so little time. But uh, he's done some very incredible relative strength work, and I've seen him in person. He's did some really good talks on that. So I would, you know, you might want to uh, follow up on some of his uh, his stuff, which I find interesting. Uh, Mike Moody's got a little bit more simpler approach to it, but I uh, learned a lot from Mike from seeing him in person. But this momentum it changes quickly, it ends badly. But in watching this Landry 100 list, uh, I'm able to kind of see where the momentum is flowing. Uh, if any, and then momentum ends badly. Uh, notice like the NASDAQ tank really hard. Those momentum type of stocks. Uh, Russell 2000, take a look at that real quick. It tanked really hard and fast. So this is what happens when momentum ends. It, it ends badly. And if I could ever solve for that, one more thing, uh, you'd never see my fat ass again. Uh, there's no need to go through all these other sectors. Most look like the overall market itself. Someone, uh, I think it was David, asked me, uh, one of the Davids in here, about uh, transports and how do I feel about the fact that they rolled over. Well, it's just one more sign. You can see you have a bow tie back here in the transports. Let's take a look at the weekly. I don't put a lot of credits into the fact that uh, you could time the market off the transports or you should time the market off the transports, I should say. That's what the Dow theorists do. But I do see it as one part of the puzzle. And you can look at the death cross here. Or you can look at the fact that we had a weekly bow tie. Look how beautiful that weekly bow tie is, okay? Weekly bow tie uh, right around here, and then official trigger right around here. So transports, as you can see, look like they're in trouble. This is a weekly chart, remember. This is not a daily chart, much different picture, or much of the same picture, you can see. Pretty serious rollover for a long, long time. And, yes, they did roll over before the overall market. So you could say, hey, Dave, you see this transports went first. Well. Okay, I saw him roll over, and I pointed out that they were rolling over, and I said, you got to add that to pieces of the puzzle. And I've done quite a few columns on that where I've literally like taken a little uh, clip art graphic of the puzzle and put little pieces in it, and you got to fit them all together. you got to look at everything. you got to look at gold. you got to look at bonds. you got to look at transports. you got to look at the P's. you got to look at the Rusty. you got to look – I don't think you have to look at the Dow, but look at the Dow if you want to. And, of course, you got to look at the NASDAQ, and then – Look at a look at several thousand charts every day to get a feel for what's going on, and then look at the new highs every day, which I which I've done over the past five or six years since I started managing, so to speak, this Landry 100, because that shows me where the money is flowing, what's making new highs, and what's not. In more recent times, I've noticed that some of these more so-called defensive issues, such as foods, are now making new highs. That to me is more of a negative than a positive because it means that there's 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 my kunash just slipped out that means that there's a flight to safety going on <laughs> um that's happening in the market it, that does not excite me now can these defensive stocks and these metals and mining and commodity related stocks such as energies also and uh chemicals is that enough to push the market higher i don't know I don't think so. Uh, I'm, I'm always a tech guy, a big fan of tech. I think you need that technology to keep a market going. But stranger things have possibly happened. All right, I think you guys get the picture. We've got some areas that are bottoming out. Most areas still rolling over. Market still looks iffy. You know what's funny is no matter how many times I say the market still looks iffy, I still get an email. Dave, are you bullish or bearish? Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> Craig says, RS really needs multiple time frames. Uh, Craig, I still owe you an email. <laughs> Every time I walk into my office, I've got a rooster in my office, which is going to sound kind of odd. And Craig sent me a, 
something and I put, uh, he sent me a, a, a jug of Mountain Dew and I put it next to my rooster. Um, anyway, that's an inside joke. So I need to send you an email explaining the rest of that. Uh, Craig says, RS really needs multiple time frames to work. Yeah, I agree with you on that. Um, I used to do a lot of work with RS. And now I go back to the – I always come back to the empirical stuff. I kind of get out on the fringe a little bit, and I kind of get into a lot of um, – not so much mechanical stuff, but kind of like sorting and, and, and things like that and measuring relative strength and looking for delta relative strength. And then I find myself coming back to just the empirical research and looking at the charts. And that's why I haven't really gotten around – to studying Gary's stuff because Gary's stuff is a little bit more involved and the bottom line without reading it or knowing it, but just listening to him, which he was fascinating by the way, but I know I'm going to come back to the, just looking at the charts once again, but relative strength could be a lot of fun and it's something that you should, you should play with. Okay. And if you have TC and you can do this at other packages, um, I just so happen to like TC, and, and I'm, I, I was a distributor last I checked. Uh, so if you're interested in TC, let me know. But if you measure, and I like to measure like from highs to like the recent period. So if we do this, and you click OK, and we take a look at what's going on in the market, okay, by sorting this relative strength. Now, I already knew this. I just got through telling you. Gold and metals and mining and silver are looking pretty good right now. Well, even if I didn't go through all 2,000 or so stocks, I guess it's closer to three in my tradable universe, even if I didn't go through all 239 sectors, and all I did was run this little relative strength scan, okay, what, did I, what do I see? Well, look at this. Gold and silver, or ranked in the top highest of all of these stocks on a relative strength basis. Remember earlier I was talking about some of these defensive issues? Look, right there, tobacco and cigarettes. People smoke at a bear market. Some people probably smoke a little more, okay? And then also notice we got utilities, okay? Utilities are kind of coming up here. So you can take a look at these things. By the way, PCBs, printed circuit boards, okay? That's one thing I wanted to point out that I forgot to point out. The um, semiconductors are doing a little bit better now. Now, are they turning a the corner? I don't know. But they're doing better than they had been. And the thing about the semis is semis sold off before the market tanked. And that was one of those signs along with the transports. I'm a big fan of watching the semis as to help, to help me time the overall market more than I am watching the transports. But again... Transports are still one piece of the puzzle. So it's probably semis first and foremost, transports a little bit further down the line, and then, of course, the indices themselves would be, like, number one thing to look at. But you can see through a relative strength sort. Now, like Craig said, the you have to look at multiple time frames. Now, we just looked at um, – we just looked at for the peak down, but let's take a look at from this trough up here. So the market's up 5.22% based on the uh, spiders. And let's hit OK. And then we can see, look, copper, bam, 27%. So well, what is copper again? Well, copper is commodity stock. Remember, I just talked about the civvies. Look at that, civvies, 20%. Okay. Uh, now, the reason I'm not rushing on buying a lot of civvies just yet is civvies are still at relatively high levels. Okay. But the energies, and look, what do we have right here? Oil and gas, equipment and services. The energies are at multi, multi-year lows. So I'm more excited about this than the semis, but I might not completely rule out the semis as a possible setup. And you can see the energies looking pretty good, bases the oil and gas equipment services. So these relative state strange sorts can be useful, but again, I like to do a lot of empirical research. So I already know that aluminum is going higher. I already know that independent oil and gas is going higher. I already know that silver stocks are going higher. And then there's PCBs. I know the PCBs are going higher because I've looked at all these charts. I know that the major oils are going higher, okay? So you kind of get the idea. But Craig's point is a very valid one. You want to look at multiple time frames. And the reason you want to look at multiple time frames is and this is something that I've never gotten around to doing a whole lot of research on. And, again, my research is just empirical. But I think that it's fodder for some wonderful research. Uh, many, many years ago in the trading markets days, we were trying to – 
uh, get a guy who was um, I've, I've since forgotten uh, who he is. I don't even know if he's still doing it, but he's he was doing a lot of relative strength, delta relative strength type of analysis. And he actually had a program that did some really cool things with delta relative strength. Delta means change. So it's more important to study the delta relative strength than the relative strength in and of itself. And I think that's what Craig is alluding to. And I'll give you a case in point. I live in South Louisiana. You know, you go outside, it's 40 degrees. That's freezing for us, okay? So if I tell you it's 40 degrees in South Louisiana, that you have a piece of information. That's cold, right? But it's like, if I tell you, oh, that's nothing, it was... 25 degrees two hours ago, well, now we have a delta, okay? We have that change in temperature. So it's cold, but it's getting hotter, okay? Or, if, or if like this time of year, sometimes we get 80 degrees outside. Uh, but that's nothing because it was 100 degrees last week or whatever, week before. So now you know it's getting a little cooler as fall is getting here, although it's still fairly hot. So that delta is important to look at. If you looked at the relative strength of energies longer term, you're going to say, well, wait a minute. The energies don't look that great. Here's the energies, okay? So shorter term, they're up 10%. But if we did a relative strength sort going back like to there, okay, they're down 33%. Let's take a look, take a look at the spiders. Uh, let's see if we could do that real quick. What's the date on that? Last thing, I promise. I won't go too far on this tangent. Uh, September 14th, I'm sorry, August 29th. So if we go look at the spiders from August 29th, if I could find it, talk amongst yourselves. There it is, right? Oh, close enough, somewhere in here. Oh, there we go. Oops. There it is. Okay. And we drag that forward to today. Well, S&P is down not even a half a percent since last August, okay? But if we click OK, and then we find the energies in here. I could find them. You're going to find that the energies are doing pretty bad. Okay. Look, oil, oil's down here, aluminum, gold, independent oil, metals and mining, silver, steel. And, these, are, these are the last of the last. Okay. All the way down at the bottom of the list. So Craig has a very valid point. I'm not just saying that because he's a client. You need to look at multiple time frames. And if you're looking at a long, long term time frame, you got to be careful not to fight the last war. OK, great questions coming in. Thank you, guys. Craig wants to look at the dollar. Let's take a look at the dollar. In fact, let's uh, go ahead and open it up for um, individual um, stocks. Now, here's the deal. Um, and this is where all the pieces of the puzzle come together. I was going to, I totally forgot to bring up the dollar. I'm glad you brought it up, Craig. Um, notice that I wouldn't rush out and short the dollar just yet, although there are some Forex pairs that might be worth shorting when it comes to uh, the dollar. You know, my problem when people ask me about uh, what I think about certain Forex things, pairs, my problem is I never, uh, I never remember what I traded. I just kind of look at, that's the beauty of, you know, not that you want to rush out and, and, and make trading an inefficient market your complete, um, sorry, efficient market your complete methodology. But I will occasionally fire off a forex trade, and I never remember or never even know what I'm in or what I'm not in, or whether I'm long or short, because I just kind of look at the charts on a purest basis. Whereas with stocks, I, I do the same thing, but I I know if it's an energy stock or not, and I tend to remember the names because it's a health service or whatever, um, and I'm looking at those every day. Whereas the pairs. I could care less, okay? Maybe I should pay more attention. But I know that some pairs, or I think dollar yen is rolled over uh, and, and might be worth shorting in here. But you can see that the dollar's been beginning to weaken. Now, why is this important? It's important because commodities are dollar denominated. And as that dollar begins to drop, the price of the commodity will go up because you could buy less and less commodities with that dollar. I think I got that right. So the scarcity goes up. So that's something to keep an eye on. Absolutely. That dollar starts breaking down. Those commodities are going to go flying. Now, keep in mind that sometimes there's a little lead and lag with this intermarket technical analysis. I don't want to get into all that right now. But just make sure that you realize there is a little lead and lag. Don't necessarily try to time one market off the other. But when you're putting that puzzle together, 
it helps to have a few pieces such as this, okay? This day is cold. The weeks is three weeks. This day is cold. Three weeks is cold. Three months is cold. We see the trend start to change on a day, but it's confirmed more on weekly. So RSI is working more or less the same as bow ties in different time frames. It's the same stuff, more or less, in the end. Yeah, Craig, and, and that's the thing, too. you got to remember that a lot of technicals often come together at the same point. Let's say you have a 200-day moving average and the market consolidates. Well, guess what? That 200-day moving average will become resistance because people say, well, a 200-day moving average is going to be resistance. Well, it's not just because of that. It's also because a lot of technicals come together at the same point. So if you're using RSI or whatever you want to use, I'm not a big fan of any indicators other than the occasional moving average, but you're going to find a lot of technicals come together at the same time. Now, I haven't plotted a 200-day moving average in a long, long time, but where's the 200-day moving average? For all intents and purposes, 2025, okay? So if we clean the chart up a little bit and we look at 2025 and we draw a line backwards in time, What's above 2025? A plethora of trading. So here's the thing. You don't have to learn everything in the world about technical analysis. And if you're in the business long enough, you will. But don't worry about learning everything. Don't worry about learning RSI unless that's something you're into. Okay. Just learn some chart patterns. It doesn't have to be every chart pattern in the world because that you could end up with analysis paralysis if you do. But learn some chart patterns, learn how to use moving averages, and uh, use them kind of, uh, you know, don't use them too liberally, and you'll do just fine. But yeah, like Craig's pointing out, there's no doubt in my mind that some of this RSI analysis is going to dovetail in with the bow tie, just like the death cross. The death cross happened as did the bow tie. So, you know, if you're following death crosses, then follow death crosses, okay? Good points. Great points. Okay, shorted rare from Landry List. This AM just hit one to one in 90 minutes. Good for you, Phil. Rare was in my Landry List as a possible short recently, and as you can see, so far so good. Yep. A little dangerous, though. A little dangerous as a short. Um, recently, I got asked about Landry List, and you got to realize that in the core portfolio, my first, obviously, want to make money first and foremost, but also. I kind of take that, I forget the Latin term for it, but I take that do no harm doctor's creed. Whereas even if I like a setup and it's kind of dangerous, too dangerous, I think, to make it worthwhile to put into the core portfolio, I'll put it in the Landry list, but I won't actually put it in the core portfolio because I know some of you guys out there, a little bit more advanced, I know Phil's a, a professional trader, uh, They could, you could take the ball and run with it and know the nature of the beast. Whereas a lot of other people, um, I try to be a little bit more conservative in what I do. And that's why you'll see some of these more aggressive stocks on the Landry list. And not that I don't put crazy stocks on the portfolio, or I should say not crazy, but volatile stocks. But in some cases, you won't see these make it to the actual portfolio because they're a little bit too, I think it's going to increase the volatility overall portfolio too much. Hopefully that made sense. Um, but yeah, good for you. Good for you, Phil. And that's the thing. You know, I don't want my service to be a chip sheet. Uh, where it's like do exactly this on this exact stock, even though I do have that element to it, I would also make it an idea generator, and that's where it's kind of hard to quantify. You know, do I go in and say, well, all the stocks I picked always do this or have always done this longer term? You know, I, I don't know how to quantify all that, but I could tell you that the ones I picked and how they work, and that's why I do that model portfolio in there. Ooh, Chief Arman really wound up today. A higher low or a lower a pivot low? I don't know what the question is. Okay, Dave says, DuPont, chemicals, plastics, polymers, feedstocks. Okay. They use a lot of nat gas to produce the product. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. I don't know if that makes it a, an expense or how does that work? I don't know. That's interesting. Wasn't it, uh, what was the line of graduate? Pulls, uh, what's his name aside? Plastics. He was right. Can I please buy a ticket for the next train? <laughs> you are an unsentimental man. I guess unsentimental then. I guess I'm talking about sentiment. Okay. When the moving average starts to crisscross after downtrend, a sign of accumulation. 
Well, you know, you got to be careful with that accumulation, distribution, all that, all that talk. Just just look at the charts. Keep keep your eye on on the bigger picture thing that's going on. Um, I know a lot of people talk. Oh, this is markets in distribution phase. It's an accumulation phase. I, I don't know. I think you got to be careful with that kind of stuff. Um, sometimes the market is just choppy. Okay, and I I see you know up, down, or choppy. And then, like Craig pointed out, then you got to look at the different time frames on that. Okay. Metals mining leads to cat. Metals mining leads to cat. You know what? Good point, Joe. Never thought about that. But you know, I don't want to try to, I don't want to try to do too much analysis and, and connect too many dots because I think you can get in trouble. Uh, but I do think you know, certain. You know, it's like uh, some little old lady was telling me years ago that her broker made her buy fertilizer because the there was a flood and washed away all the fertilizer. So the fertilizer company is going to be the next big deal. I don't know. I think you got to be careful when you're doing that kind of analysis. But in this particular case, I could maybe draw those lines a little bit more clearly because obviously you're going to need some of that cat equipment to um, – I had a friend who was, who was pretty much nuts. <laughs> he uh, he made a billion dollars trading options, and then um, he round-tripped it all. I could talk about him. He's no longer with us. But he had a cat named Kitty, literally. And uh, when he started to make a lot of money, he would just do things like he'd buy a cat. I'm like, why'd you buy a cat? It was in a downtrend, looked like crap. He goes, oh, Kitty told me to. You know, so it, and he would buy, there used to be a, um, a, a, a symbol that uh, that meant something nasty on, in a slang basis. And he would buy that stock just so he can call his broker and, and uh, make jokes. Um, he was He was an interesting individual. Uh, weekly indices are still rising. Weekly indices still above rising SMA. All right. Well, think about that. Okay, rising 200 SMA. Uh, th that's a 500-day moving average. Is that right? Did I do the math right on that? So weekly indices still above rising 200 SMA. Uh, there it is, right there. That's exponential. Let's see. Let's do a uh, simple, and let's make it some color so we know. Let's make it uh, cyan. Okay. Yeah, they're still above it, but you know you got a long ways to go to even get to it. So that's uh, what is that? Twenty five percent drop. That's that's serious bear market territory if you go all the way down here. So. Remember, on the short side especially, you got to pay attention to these somewhat shorter signals. And this is the weekly signal, which I think is still significant. And, you know, I hope it goes higher. Again, I'm not apologizing. Thousand days. Oh, you're right. Five times two is a thousand. Thank you, Carol. Carol's on the service, too. My peeps are smart. Smarter than me. Glad I have you guys and girls. UNP. UNP bottoming with oil. Uh, you know, it might be. I mean, look at that. You got a nice little bow tie here uh, on a pullback or what pulls back a little bit. Absolutely. Let's back the chart out a little bit. Um, ideally, I like to see this at much lower levels, but I hear you. It's a multi it's multi year lows. I certainly can't argue with that. OK, that looks OK. So who said that? Susan, I'm gonna give you a high five. First high five of the day, I think it's still price, right? And MAs work around the same. Um, I think so. Okay, CKBK LTR IPO PHT. CKBK LTR are those three stocks? CK? No. BK. Brian's left, so I'm not sure what he's asking. PHT. D, uh, no, the TKR for Ferrari, it will consider the future. George Justin Carl, hmm, cheers to. Yeah, I'm not sure what you're talking about, Brian, but Brian's left the building, so we can't talk to Brian. Okay, can't we answer that, I think. Uh, Stan Weinstein had 30-week relative strength on these charts. Uh, okay. Yeah, you need a, that's a book you need a sequence of profiting in bull and bear markets. That's a good book to read. What would you short IYR? Okay. It's one of those pirate stocks. Uh, no, I think lately real estate's been doing a little better in here. 
and uh, let's clean this chart up a little bit if we can. And you know, let's look at where it is. So let's go back in time. So yeah, the longer term trend is down, but it looks like it's kind of flattened out in here. So I wouldn't rush out and short this particular stock because it looks like it's already dropped significantly. It's a little wide and loose, but lately I've been seeing REITs actually hit some new highs. And again, that's that empirical type of research. I wish I had all my list updated so I can show you. I've just been behind on all this. I've got them all written out in a notebook. i got to update them. But I've been seeing quite a few REITs lately. I don't know if I'm recognizing names. Let me take a look. Uh, showing up in the Landry list. So that's got me thinking that I don't want to rush out and short them. I'm not a big fan of trading REITs anyway because they're um, lower in volatility. Okay, um, Phil says, Rare was taken with much tighter stop and smaller size of typical Landry trade. Health warning was listened to. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they're dangerous trades. It, you know, it's hard to, in some cases, with, you can have too much of a good thing. It's hard to take a super volatile trade, unless I've got several of them that are worthwhile, and, and put them in the Landry list because, I'm sorry, not the Landry list, the, the core portfolio, because of the dangers involved. I, I want to try to, uh, have longer term consistent growth in there. And that doesn't mean that we won't put in a crazy uranium or a crazy uh, solar stock when I think the risk are worth it. But like right now on the short side, a volatile tech stock, super volatile tech stock, it's a little scary to put that in. You know, if they come out a big, uh, uh, some sort of announcement, they just cured whatever, um, then you could be in a lot of trouble really fast. So it's kind of, it comes back to that do no harm type of thing. We are at 2,000 on S&P, and the 50 is at 2,000. has been a big number for support and resistance over the past couple of years. Yeah, those big round numbers uh, can uh, – I don't place too much credence in them, but I hear you. Uh, those big round numbers can be important in markets. Okay, I wouldn't trade off of them and all, but again, as far as the pieces of the puzzle, uh, sure, absolutely. It's worth uh, taking a look at some of those numbers. Let's put the 50-day in. Yeah, you know, again, the, um, you know, 2,000, big round number. Where did we retrace to? Around 2,000. Where's the moving average? Around 2,000. So, again, a lot of technicals coming together at one point. So, good uh, good point, Phil. All right, Steve's been waiting patiently. Uh, nice webinar, Dave. Thank you, Steve. Steve is not a show. XKX, Skeeters. Skeeters. Otherwise known as Skechers. Yeah, Skechers, we actually talked about this uh, way back here. We talked about it as a possible short in the weekend charts, and so far, so good. I think it's a little too late now. And, you know, this is this is a, a prime example of how the market doesn't always move in your time frame. It looked like a wonderful short back here. Initially, it looked pretty good, and then it went right back up, and then, of course, then it rolls over. So, yeah, I think it's still in trouble. You're welcome, Jim. Jim, this is another good webinar. All right, we've got to go in the lightning round now. Sorry I, I pontificated so much. Phil wants to know about INCY. Eh, it's a little all over the place. Uh, I think I would avoid that one. It's just too crazy. Pan W. Oops. Uh... Now, I hear what you're saying. It bounced up to the 50. It looks like it, I think it's I, – I hear you. I think it's a trouble, but there's no pattern that I trade there uh, personally, but I hear you. Uh, mining equipment, tires too. Oh, tires. Oh, okay. That's a good point. Good point, Greg. Need tires. Got to have tires. Used to be a commercial in Lafayette back when I was going to school. I know tires don't smell good, but you got to have them. And if you got to have them, you might as well buy them from me. BWXT for Andre. Can't, oh, there it is. Um, I don't like this crazy bar here, but I certainly hear you. Uh, it's making new highs. Maybe on pullbacks along the way, we'll have to reevaluate. But, yeah, so far so good. Nice breakout. It's one of the stocks that's defying gravity. Again, I prefer the stocks at lower levels. Like, and I'm not going to say it. Well, I'll say it anyway. Energies and metals and mining. Uh, this stock here, AF for Andre also. Just kind of sideways, but I hear what you say. It's kind of wake it up in here. Maybe if it may do highs on a pullback, sure. Uh, beat for Bob. Beat is one that has lost a lot of steam. Yep, there it is. Uh, 
as a possible short, maybe. The only problem is it's a little volatile and technology, and you have a tremendous amount of support below the market. So I wouldn't short it because you've got all the support right below the market. And again, you know, technology stocks would be careful. Uh, OAS for Peter. Okay, we've got room for like maybe two more. Uh, looks okay. The only thing that kind of jumps out at me is this uh, this mountain of overhead supply that we have right above the market. It looks okay. So try to find some oil stocks that don't have so much trading just above the market because this could cap, could be the keyword in that sentence, obviously, but this could cap your gains. Okay. Uh, EMC on Dell spec buy. EMC on Dell. What does that mean? Oh, EMC up on Dell spec buy. Yeah, I, you can't trade off of that though. It's just kind of it's all over the place. It's it's Jackie Mason stock. It's up. It's down. It's up. It's down. So EMC might buy him, huh? Cool. Well, you know, and that that could be a positive coming into the market. Not that you want to trade off of that or speculation, but. We start getting buyouts again. That would be a positive piece. And we start seeing some of these uh, uh, like semis follow through to the upside. That would be a positive piece. So just keep looking for clues. Right now, I still think the market's in trouble. Somebody's still going to email me. Dave, you bearish? Okay, well, you know, I hate to label myself, but I still think the market's in trouble. How's that? So just be careful out there. I'm getting a plethora of buy signals on loads of stuff. Like Rio, BTU, BHP, which in areas press uh, is predicting will disappear. Junk of bottom. But, yeah, uh, yeah, they're, they're working out. Great webinar. You're welcome, Joe. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for attending. Uh, yeah, you know, don't get too caught up in the media. And what is, is if, if those stocks are bottoming out and setting up, then buy them. And, and you never know. You'll find out after the fact uh, what the reasonings are for why they're going up. And that's a beautiful thing. It's like the news, when a stock starts going up, that good news comes into the market just sort of magically. And that's the beauty of reading the charts. Doesn't always work. Again, never see me again if it did, but it's just a framework for you to kind of work around. And that's what stops it for if it doesn't. Um, thank you guys so much for attending. I appreciate it. And girls, as you can tell, I have a blast doing these shows and a lot of fun. Hopefully I pulled it all together. I'll listen to it to see if I did. Uh, but hopefully I was able to pull it all together and get my uh, thoughts and feelings out there. And, and, and hopefully you guys and girls learned something today. Uh, but if anything, I learn a lot in the process too. So I appreciate you guys uh, and girls again being here. Anyway, no show next week. I'm going to be in Vegas. If you guys are in Vegas, uh, come out and see me. Maybe we'll grab a beer or something or uh, come to the uh, presentation. I appreciate it. Um, you're always nervous about who will show up. You know, sometimes these shows – People don't know me. People know me in other areas, but they don't know me within like these uh, these trade shows and all. So if you guys, a uh, hey, girl, show up, that'd be awesome. I'll give you a high five. Uh, everybody have a fantastic weekend. We don't talk again. In fact, uh, have a fantastic next couple of weekends. Idiot answer questions, DavidDaveLandry.com. See you guys and girls again, hopefully, in a couple of weeks. Thank you so much.